and um, we'll be we'll be sharing um, uh, this on our YouTube channel, which will circulate um, as well as um, directly to our registrants um, as we move forward. So without further ado, Arlene Narvaez. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nia, for your introduction. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? I'm gonna share my PowerPoint as well. <clears throat> Oh, one second. Uh, so I'd like to thank everybody for joining today. Uh, I, I don't see everyone's uh, uh, video on and that's be as comfortable if you'd like, but if you're giving me any kind of uh, positive feedback, head nod or negative shake, like I disagree, I won't be able to see it. So maybe you add it to the chat comments and or use your emoji reactions. Uh, I'd like to start with acknowledging the land that I'm coming to you from. I'm in the Los Angeles area. And I wanna acknowledge I'm speaking from the traditional territory and for the interpreter, the uh, spelling is on the screen, the Shumash Tongva, Fernandeño, Tataviam, and Keats lands. And if you'd like to check your own land acknowledgement, there is a website that you could check that I posted there at the bottom of the PowerPoint. A little more self-promotion is, uh, yes, as uh, Dr. Yam mentioned, this is what I do. I'm an interpreter. And currently with the pandemic, I had the opportunity of working with our local leaders uh, to spread the message. And an important reason for that is a lot of people may think, well, there are captioning, you know, why, why don't deaf people just read the captions? But as we'll learn today is uh, that's not everybody's first language and it's not everybody's um, first understanding of a message. And in fact, I'll be the first to acknowledge that I'm actually even not the very best choice uh, to be interpreting these messages. We've seen the deaf community respond with wanting deaf interpreters um, interpreting these messages, which would put a deaf person next to their example, uh, Newsom, and me in front, uh, in front of them to feed them the information so that they could translate it into a language that is more accessible. And we'll hopefully today get an understanding of why um, sometimes language uh, isn't quite understood the way we think it might be. Uh, additionally, uh, with uh, my experience, I want to also share with you that I worked with an organization called NCIEC, which is no longer uh, in operation, but National Center of Interpreter Education Centers received federal funding in 2010 we received five-year funding and then we got one year extra. So it was a total of six years to do research on what trilingual interpreting work is and the demands on the interpreter. Because we were finding that I'm a trained ASL interpreter, but I was thrown into trilingual work. There was no, until now, training available for trilingual interpreters until that research. And uh, we specifically work with ASL, English and Spanish, but we thought that the research might apply to other interpreting languages. Um, and what we were researching was, what are the demands on the interpreter? Why are the interpreters complaining that they're tired? Why are they complaining that they're burnt out and overworked? And, and what is it that we're looking for? And what we found in doing that research is part of what I'm gonna bring you today is that you cannot separate culture from communication. And you cannot assume that one language is going to transmit your message. Uh, that was a kind of a big deal because we kind of already knew that, but we proved it with the research that we did. So today, what is today about? I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about deafness, communication in general, the influence that culture has on communication and how that leads ultimately to inclusion. I hope that together we can come to that understanding uh, as we talk, hopefully we get some, some participation. So if we could 
uh, launch that poll we've got, we'll see where we all are at in terms of understanding. Please let us know if you can't see the poll. So we've almost got everybody responding. We'll just allow for a little bit more. Okay, it looks like everyone has answered. <clears throat> and let's see what those answers are. Can you all see the results? Oh, here we go. So I would like to address each one of these uh, individually before we move on. And I'll let you know the, the answer. Um, I've seen them by hearing impaired is actually more about us than it is about them. It's because we feel bad. And in the deaf community, the word impaired implies that something's wrong with them. In fact, the same is true for the blind community that feels the same way about the terminology visually impaired. And if we think about that term impaired, it really is more about how we feel about calling somebody deaf. But really, um, people in the deaf community are proud to be deaf. Uh, for us, and when I say us, I'll say it's hearing people have a distinction between deaf and hard of hearing. And for us, deaf means profoundly deaf and hard of hearing means maybe there's some speech, maybe there, there's some hearing, but in the deaf community, deaf means I sign whether I have some hearing or not. And hard of hearing means I've lost my hearing, but I don't sign at all. Um, so deaf and hearing has more in the deaf community has more to do with culture than it does with actual function. But for hearing people, it has more to do with function than um, the ability to hear. Uh, for the second question, American Sign Language is not universal. Um, and as we'll learn today, culture has a lot to do with how a language develops. And if we think about a culture influencing the way a language develops, that it's it should make sense that American Sign Language, while it does have influence the way spoken English has around the world, uh, it is used a lot in the US and in Canada. It's not the main language for deaf people around the world because American culture influences American Sign Language. And so other cultures will influence their own language and their own development. And the same is true for dialects, spoken languages. So if you think away, Think of the way languages are different in other countries. It's the same reason that sign languages are different in other countries. Mexican and Spanish sign language are not the same. Everybody got it. That's absolutely correct. Uh, Mexican sign language is actually called LSM, Lengua de Señas Mexicanas. And Spanish sign language is from Spain. So you can imagine they're not even near close to each other in order to influence each other. So the languages are different, definitely different. Uh, 
which law provides language services for people in medical settings? Absolutely correct, whoever voted for both. It started actually with the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which provides for spoken languages in order to facilitate communication and inclusion into these settings that receive federal dollars. But the difference is that the Americans with Disabilities Act focuses on disabilities. So while the Civil Rights Act says you must provide language access, the ADA says you must provide accessibility to those who are disabled. So if a deaf person comes to a medical institution needing services, first and foremost, the Civil Rights Act Acts grants them that access. But secondly, if they're if they're declined in that way, well then the ADA says, well, you're disabled and, and you have a right to, to a reasonable accommodation, is what it's called. Um, <clears throat> people with hearing loss do not use Braille. Yes, thank you for voting. Uh, those who said true, because Braille is for the visually. Uh, look, I was going to say visually impaired, but I caught myself for the blind community. <laughs> so many people always say to me, oh, you must know Braille. And I think, mm, no, <laughs> I don't. Uh, but I think it's such a, a, a popular, we, we associate the word with disability, but we don't associate the word with the right disability. So uh, deaf people do not use Braille. <clears throat> And Arlene, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. There was one question on the chat um, uh, that says, what does that mean for person first language? Is that not an acceptable term to use? In terms of deafness being, uh, that's, and thank you for interrupting me. It's, I'm watching a lot of things here on my screen, so I appreciate that. Um, it, Deafness it does not refer to the person. So it, it's the same idea. Um, I, a person just happens to be deaf. Uh, there's also the association in the deaf community of the pride that comes with being deaf. There's a lot of culture and experience and traditions that comes with being deaf. And so um, I'd venture to say that the person is more wanting to be called deaf than to be called hearing impaired. But you're right in terms of person first language. And, and I believe that you mean in the way we refer to someone as person on a wheelchair versus the wheelchair bound person. Uh, in the deaf community, there's such pride with deafness. And uh, you see the difference really, it really comes down to the distinction if somebody signs or if they don't. If somebody doesn't sign, they will call themselves hard of hearing or a person with hearing loss. But a person who does sign has such pride in sign language and culture that they want to be called deaf, very strongly want to be called deaf. I hope that answers the question. <clears throat> and sign language does have, I just did another question about uh, flexibility for dialects. There are, there are dialects in sign language. There are some regional signs, even in the US of the way, um, someone signs, I, I'll tell you, I'll, I sign the way I sign store, but I've seen someone in San Antonio, this is a sign for San Antonio, Texas, and that's also been a store. <laughs> how do you get, how does that become a store? I don't know. So there's regionalisms in the US. And I'll tell you another one is H hospital it's for that sleeve, I think old fashioned, but in the East coast there's hospital because the cross changes from the shoulder to the, for the nurse's hat. I don't use this sign, but when I see it, I recognize it. So there are definitely dialects. And I, as a hearing person, have an accent and sign language um, that you all probably wouldn't catch, but deaf people catch quick. So real quick, this is gonna be a lot of numbers, but just so you have an idea of how many deaf people there are here. This is from Gallaudet Research Institute. And Gall if those of you who aren't familiar, Gallaudet is a university in DC that's the first all deaf university with deaf professors and admitting deaf students. And only in recent years has started to admit hearing students to their, their school. And in their research of the federal statistics, they found that two out of every four 
two to four of every thousand people in the US are functionally deaf, which means um, they became deaf maybe later, they learned how to function with their deafness, et cetera. Uh, and with their numbers, they came to uh, the number of one out of every thousand became deaf before the age of 18. information. But in further research, they looked at people with a severe hearing impairment that included deaf. And they really looked at, at those numbers as uh, being higher. And they really looked at 9 to 22 out of every thousand having a severe hearing impairment or who call themselves deaf. But as you see at the last statement, at least half of these people reported their hearing loss after the age of 64 which probably means these are the people that call themselves hard of hearing, uh, latent deaf or experiencing hearing loss later in life and probably not gonna pick up another language. But they said, if you really include everybody that has trouble hearing, the numbers are really much bigger. And they found that it's really actually 37 to about 140, which is a big range out of every thousand people in the US having some kind of hearing loss. And why are the numbers so wonky? Well, a lot of people are embarrassed to admit that they have a hearing loss. And a lot of people are hard of hearing and function with a hearing aid, and they don't associate themselves with deafness. And so a lot of the way people self-identify influences these numbers, definitely. We also, we see ASL more in the mainstream today. And so it's increasingly more popular to learn sign language. But back in the day, deaf children were deprived of learning sign language. And so there's a little barrier with uh, people identifying themselves as deaf or hard of hearing if they're not exposed to the deaf community already. And so here's an example I have for you of how the language might be different. On your right hand side, you see the American Sign Language alphabet, which is one handed. I can say the whole alphabet with one hand and count from the number one to 999 using one hand, because at 1000, I need two, two hands. And on the left hand side, you see British two handed finger spelling. Finger spelling is used to clarify names to uh, give, you know, pronouns, um, uh, formal names, introduce myself, things like that, titles. And so imagine I just finger spell real quick with one hand, but in British uh, two-handed finger spelling, it, that's, that's ASL to me, <laughs> but just gives us an idea of how the language can be so different. So, I wanna take a step back and just talk about how we acquire information. So I'm gonna give you the answers to my question. We acquire information in a casual way and in a formal way. And when we acquire information casually, what I mean is overheard in conversations and directly or indirectly. So you may all, for example, be standing at the grocery checkout line and hear the person in front of you going on and on about this new frozen pizza. And you might be like, I gotta go get this frozen pizza. And that's how you hear about something. The same is true for um, maybe email scams from people trying to get a million dollars with your bank account. You maybe hear other friends say, oh, did you get that scam? And you know already by overhearing that you're not the secret prince of another country, you're not gonna get a million dollars. But you know this because you overhear the joke and you keep hearing it, you keep hearing it and, you, and it's reinforced. The other way that we get information is education or by information that we seek. So think formally is something that you seek out. You all sought out to, to sign up for this workshop. And so this is what I would call the formal gathering of information. And this is important <clears throat> because how do we know 
like what's the right gym to join what's the best beauty product what car has a good reputation has a bad reputation we could either seek out that information or we can trust our friends or we can overhear the neighbor who happens to be a mechanic talk about this toyota is really an amazing car if we think about things in this context and information in this context, this is how uh, we receive good information and bad information. And many times, whether we know it or not consciously or not, how we inform ourselves and put this in context with people who are deaf or people who do not use the language of the majority. They're losing this information which is a very basic reason for why um, there's misunderstandings and why people don't trust and don't believe. Because when you keep hearing a reinforced message, that email is a scam. You have the confidence to turn it down or delete it. But when you don't hear that reinforced message, you're wondering, am I losing a million dollars? Yeah, I'm kind of being a little funny, but but it happens because people get scammed out of money all the time. And if we think about in context, who are the people, and it's my best example, I apologize to you if it's a bad example, but think about who the people we see being scammed and it's older people or it's people with disabilities or people who, who their language isn't the language of the majority. Those are the people who aren't overhearing this information and they're not getting access to 100% of the information. They're only getting the information that the holder of the information says is your right to have access. I've provided you with limited knowledge. I've provided you with limited translation. I've provided you with limited access to resources. And so that confidence is gone. And so is that trust because you don't get to determine all these pieces I heard and I get to have my own agency and say, this is what I decide. This is a scam. No, now I'm, 100% relying on what you've given me. So this is really an important piece of access to information. And if we think about the communication process, we have to recognize that it is not a linear process. It is not one-sided. Even as I sit here and talk to you, just giving you a lot of information, I'm looking at your, at those who are showing me, I'm looking at your facial expression. I'm hoping that you're following me. I'm hoping that you understand. And if you don't, I'm going to, I'm going to adjust how I deliver my message. And for you, I hope that you're hearing my message and you either hear, oh, she, she's self-corrected, she's not herself, she's hesitated, et cetera. So we have to think that it's never one-sided. We're doing this exchange even when you think you're not. And this is important because it means that communication, whether we recognize it or not, is interactive and it's dynamic. And we together are simultaneously sending each other signals. So many parts of our message comes through in our facial expressions, our gestures, our body posture, our tone. We communicate everything, and I'm not even, I've not even yet touched sign language. We're still in spoken language here, and this is still how we communicate. You can understand if somebody's, you know, pressed for time, they got to go. Somebody's angry, somebody's upset. You can see it in their message delivery. This to me is fascinating because all these elements of a message come through in English outside of the words. In English, only 6% of the meaning of the message is found in the words. 39% of the meaning is found in vocal intonation. And get this, 55% of the message is co uh, conveyed in gestures, body language, facial expressions, et cetera. That's not even sign language yet. So our communication is very visual and very contextual. And we've not even touched on sign language. So in my mind, that just says how, how important the visual aspects of message are in sign language. 
but we cannot dismiss it in our spoken language. And this is important because we're gonna talk about how we communicate in a second, but it means that when we communicate with someone, everything has meaning. Another part of communication is a contextual environment, which is a physical location, meaning the way I talk to you outside of my gym is gonna be different than the way I talk to you in the office. The status of the participant. If I'm a teacher, I talk to a student in a different way than I maybe talk to my colleague or, or my homie outside the gym. I talk to people in a different way, depending on the status. And personal history. I do teach in a community college setting, and I find that when I see a student that I have had in several classes in the past, I talk to them a little differently than I do new students. Um, I notice that I'm a little harder on the new, the students that don't know me and the student that knows me, I'm, I'm a little more warm and because they came back for more. And noise, and noise doesn't mean sound, but anything that distracts a participant from their interaction. So it could be the room is really cold. It could be a giant delivery truck outside is distracting. It could be anything. Noise is anything that distracts from the communication. So we think about all these parts of communication. We have to acknowledge that communication is imprecise at best. There's no guarantee that the receiver will decode your message the way you intended it to be decoded. So there's no guarantee that at the end of today's workshop, you will leave with what I hope is a takeaway. And there's no guarantee uh, when you give somebody services that they will leave your office with your intention in mind and vice versa. And that brings us to this. As our goal should be to be an effective communicator. And so as an effective communicator, we strive to achieve our goals in a way that maintains or enhances our relationship. And we have to consider the styles that reflect the person's personality, personal values, their culture, in order to really make sure that our message lands. And by the way, this, is a mark of a good interpreter. A good interpreter will make sure that they can they include cultural information in the delivery of the message and make sure that both parties are having the same conversation because it oftentimes happens that one side is worried about one thing and another per person is worried about something else and they're not they're not connecting and the only person who can see it usually both sides as the interpreter because the interpreter is the one that's privy to both cultures. So now I wanna tell you, how, so we talked about culture, we talked about how we got information, but also our personality and personal values reflect in our communication as well. So it's this big complex, uh, big complex like ball of yarn I want to tell you is what I'm, I'm building for you of how we communicate. We have expressions and language choices. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by our personality reflecting our values. So my, my family example is my brother. He's the godfather. He's a padrino in my family. And I call him Nino. Nino, he's, he's my daughter's padrino, but I call him Nino. I even text him, Nino. And it's, I call him that because it's a term of endearment. And if I don't call him that, he knows I'm mad at him. But in front of his coworkers, I would never call him that. I call him Isaias. I just call him by his name. And so if you see my expressions, my expression is important because I'm trying to connect with my brother. And I'm trying to make sure he knows I'm not mad at you. This is what I say when I say Nino. But in front of his coworkers, it's almost disrespectful if I call him that because I just made him look not, not professional. In terms of my own language choices, I try really hard not to use the B word. 
And by B, I mean the one on your screen, because I do not like using the language of scarcity. I really try to focus on this abundance mindset. And so no matter what, I will not say the B word. And if somebody says it to me, I'm like, la, 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 la. I don't want to hear this word. Um, this is important because you, you may not know that when you speak to me. And you may, not, you may or may not pick up on it unless you had the same values or the same kind of idea or understanding of those expressions. This becomes important because when we understand someone's language expression and their language choices, and we can adjust to them, and it's not always about adjusting to them. I'm not asking you to change who you are, but I'm asking to have understanding, especially those of you here who are ser service providers. My job as a service provider is to gain the consumer's trust because when they trust me, they'll communicate with me. So my job is to understand this. And so I have a question for those of you who are still with me. What are your expressions or language choices that reflect your own personal values? If anybody wants to chime in or add to the chat, um, I'll give you a second to do that if anybody wants to add something. I don't know if this is right, but I talk with my hands and I use a lot of expression when I speak. And when people are very flat, when they're talking back to me or when I'm interacting with them, I'm like, oh, maybe I'm not like reaching them or maybe, you know, like I take that as like a, oh, we're not at the same place. And so I think that's probably one of my uh, language choices. I think that's exactly right, Rebecca. That's, and I like that you said how it makes you think, wait, what's happening here? That's so perfect because imagine if that makes you think, mm -hmm. what does it make the person on the other end think? Yeah. In terms of what they're looking for. And maybe someone who knows you well, who sees you on a date not using expressive language or expressive body language, there might be like, is she mad? <laughs> right? Yeah. Or I've actually had people be like, you look down actually, because you're not <laughs> as engaged, you know, in your conversation. So definitely. Yeah, definitely. That's a good one. Does anybody else want to share? I was going to just say, I know that especially now with the masks, everything that we do now with our eyes is very important. So, you know, I'm very cautious or careful the way that I'm looking and things that I'm doing and to make sure that I'm paying close attention to um, whomever it is speaking to me or I'm talking to to make sure that they know that I am paying attention. <laughs> You are so right, uh, Audra, I hope I said it correctly. I, I feel the same way about masks. I feel like, like I wanna just say to everyone, I'm nice, I just, right? I'm nice underneath this mask. But what I have noticed that really goes a long way is can tell when and if I can tell, you can tell when I'm smiling. But if you notice, you can also hear a smile on, someone by, uh, on the phone. So smiles definitely go a long way to put these uh, tensions, definitely. Does anybody else want to share? Let's see. 